Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. To join our community, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and receive the following five free benefits. First, you get the risk reduction checklist I've created from the lessons I've learned from all my guests. Second, you get my weekly email to help you increase your investment return. Third, you get a 25% discount on all ASTOTS Academy courses. Fourth, you get access to our Facebook community to get to know guests and fellow listeners. And finally, you get my curated list of the top 10 podcast episodes. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from ASTOTS Academy. And I'm here with featured guest, Dennis Yu. Dennis, are you ready to rock? Let's do it, Andrew and everybody. <laughs> Uh, super excited to get you on, uh, and I, I'm really interested in what you do, and I want to introduce you to the audience. Dennis Yu is the CEO of Blitz Metrics, a digital marketing company which partners with schools to train young adults. He's a former Yahoo search engine engineer who optimizes ads and analytics across search and social that he's turned into training to create good jobs for aspiring digital marketers. Dennis, take a minute and fill any further tidbits about your life. Oh, I'm a math guy. I'm an Asian. I learned English when I was six. I had a nearly perfect score on the SAT. And I've always thought that there's numbers and there's formulas behind everything. And that's why things like American Airlines with all the data there, or when Yahoo first started, I was one of the first people there and built the analytics. I always thought things were about data and systems and processes. And I was just very lucky to be in the right place at the right time for things like Yahoo, for Facebook's ad system launching, and a lot of things in social media. And it's been really cool to train up lots of people who are starting their digital agencies or starting their career in digital marketing to be able to create real work experience for these students and then people that are not so young, especially with COVID times, so that they can get real certification, just like you become a pilot or a doctor or a mechanic. That's exciting. I mean, one question I have is like, do, do you have to have a structured thinking and math thinking to do uh, this type of, let's say, Facebook ads or that type of thing? Or is it just, it's very helpful? Or how would you view that? It's an art and a science. So mm -hmm. if you're flying a plane, certainly there's science that you can't ignore about the physics of the aircraft. But then you can do aerobatics. There's different ways you can fly. You can be creative once you have a fundamental mastery of the, the basics. So if you, for example, are an artist, you can be creative, but mm. you still have to understand how oil and paint and how the different tools and the materials and everything, you have to understand those kinds of fundamentals. If you want to be a surgeon, certainly there's a lot of creativity now. There's a lot of innovation that's happening with things like stem cells and new cosmetic laser treatments that are coming out, but there's still science. And if you don't respect that science, you're going to kill patients. That's a great description, art and science. And uh, let me ask you another question on this before we get to the big question. And that is, a lot of my listeners, you know, would love to do more on Facebook as an example. And people like myself, every time I dip my toe into Facebook ads, I feel like I'm just donating money to Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> and I'm just curious, you know, uh, what, what is like your advice for absolute beginners or people that are trying to figure out Facebook? There's nothing to figure out about Facebook. With Facebook or Google or YouTube or Instagram or Snapchat or TikTok, they all follow the same principle. They are free to use by the users because they get ads that are paid for by marketers and advertisers like us. So when we put money into the machine, we need to understand what the machine is doing with that. Because you're not just going to go to Las Vegas and put all the money on the slots or bet it all on red. That would be gambling, which is not entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Instead, understand that the system wants to show content to whoever is most likely to engage. So if you put your analytics in place, so the system understands what a patient or what a conversion or what a sale or what a lead or whatever that valuable thing is that you're looking for, if, if the system understands what that is and how it's worth and it's tracked properly and you put the right ingredients into the system, and this is gonna sound slightly esoteric, but this is key to understand. When you let the customers do the work for you and you put in their feedback, their video, you put in your knowledge, then the system will optimize for you. So if you don't have this kind of system, if you don't put the right ingredients inside the machine, then you might as well just, if you're cooking, let's say you're following a recipe, you have random ingredients mixed together in a random way for a random amount of time at a random temperature. How likely are you gonna get chicken cacciatore? 
I think you've described my, my dilemma. That's beautifully <laughs> described. And, like, and it's not a Facebook issue. You need to understand how to use the system. And it's actually not that hard. If you use the search engine, if you use the social network, the way it was meant to be, the system will do the work for you. I think of it like a bread machine. So maybe, Andrew, you like cinnamon raisin bread, right? Fresh out of the oven, right? And so, you know, the bread machine, you put the right ingredients in there, you select cinnamon raisin bread from the menu and you press the button start. And then the system will do everything and 45 minutes, an hour later, it comes out, it opens, it dings at you, right? Or a washing machine. And it's not gonna be a donut or it's yeah. not gonna be meatloaf <laughs> because right ingredients, I understand the system, I've pressed the right buttons. That's yeah, a great- It's a great, recipe. Great description. Everything to do with digital now is a recipe. You follow the recipe with the right ingredients and you properly know how to use the technique so you don't cut your fingers off, then it's going to work for you. A lot of people, they think it's, you know, voodoo or they, they're going to bring bad ingredients. And we like to say you can't make chicken salad out of chicken shiitake. It's not so, the bread maker. It's, it's the, you, you don't have the right ingredients. You don't have the recipe. You're not skilled in using the tools. Yep. Um, and by the way, what's the best way for the listener who likes what you're talking about to get in touch with you or understand your services? So you can reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter or Instagram. If you want to look to hire us directly, then you can email me, dennis at blitzmetrics.com. And I answer that personally. Perfect. All right. Well, now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one ever goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a little bit about the circumstances leading up to it and tell us your story. I started a digital marketing agency and I thought I would put it around chiropractors and I got 80 chiropractors and I launched it at a conference. We got... 80 of these folks that paid about $2,000 to come into the program. And I put a CEO on it. I hired a couple of VAs. And a few months later, the whole thing fell apart because we didn't follow our systems and processes. And we got destroyed by having too many customers. If you can imagine a lot of people, they fail because they didn't have enough customers. They didn't have mark product market fit. We had something that everybody wanted. All these people signed up and we just weren't able to execute. In fact, we did very little work and hmm. eventually had to shut the thing down. And it was a, you know, an ugly political kind of situation. And you can imagine when a business fails, the kind of, you know, finger pointing, the politics that occurs. Happy. But, I, but I put in, you know, almost a year of my life, I put in a hundred thousand dollars a bunch of people got paid and even ran off with money, ran off with equipment, did all kinds of things when they thought that there was this kind of opportunity and there was no management. I was supposed to be the manager. I did not do my part. So let's review the lessons that you learned from that. Well, first off, just because you are a practitioner and you know how to do something doesn't mean other people know how to do that. Just because you've been successful in another kind of business doesn't mean you're going to be successful in a different kind of business or a similar kind of business. And I also learned that in the world of social media, there's a lot of influencers. You know, a lot of people are self-declared social media influencers. They're authors, speakers, coaches. A lot of these folks are not actually business owners in terms of running teams. They're solo consultant sorts of people. So it's kind of funny because the people that you hear the most from are often the people who don't have underlying businesses and teams of managers and workers and all that to be able to run them. Because if they did, they wouldn't be out there speaking all the time or hanging out on Clubhouse and these other sorts of places. And I, I learned that you should hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. And I tend to be an optimist where mm. somebody says, if you give me this business, I promise I'm gonna be able to watch over it. I'm gonna care for it like it's mine. I'm gonna grow it. I'm gonna follow all your processes. But then if they don't, you need to have a backup process. So when I was in the airline industry 25 years ago, the CEO was my mentor, which is great, Al Casey. And he told me that there's something called, well, explain to me, something called OSO. Have you heard of this, off-schedule mm. operations? No. So how many times have you been to the airport and the flight's late or the, there's a weather pattern or a flight attendant doesn't show up or something's wrong with the reclining seat where there's all kinds of little things that could happen along the way, but the flights generally don't crash. And that's because there are backup avionics. That, that's because there's backup crew. 
there's backup aircraft, there's backup processes, and there's even tertiary and you know fourth level fail safe. So if something goes wrong, there's always this kind of backup. I've learned the hard way and I'm still learning that as an entrepreneur, when something goes wrong, you have to anticipate in advance what those problems are and put systems in place. And thus you hope for the best. You give these young adults an opportunity to be a 23 year old CEO or something like that. But at the same time, if they fail, you need to be there to be able to rescue the situation. And that requires planning. That's why systematically you have to map out not just your processes and how things are supposed to work in perfect situations, but what happens if any one person doesn't do their part? What happens if a virtual assistant doesn't edit their video? What happens if somebody locks you out of the bank account? What happens if somebody steals clients? What happens if somebody doesn't show up to a meeting? What happens mm -hmm. if we don't get access to you know, the, the uh, Google account and website to be able to make landing pages? What happens, is it, see, you, it's not that we want to be pessimists, but the lesson I've continued to learn in the last 30 years, and I'm just still learning every day, is that you can never overestimate the level of preparation you need to anticipate. You know, it's kind of like the, you, the when you solve, it's over, what is it, keep it simple, stupid, where you, you, you solve a problem, but you, you think, you know what, I've made this thing idiot proof, right? I've thought of all the possibilities. And then they surprise you by coming up with ways like, oh, I cannot believe, oh, I didn't, I just, yeah, took that for granted, right? I took, it was an assumption. Of course, people know how to do this. And so when you make assumptions, that's when you get yourself in the trouble and you've got to make it so simple. And even something as simple as building a website for a chiropractor, we have a template. Mm -hmm. We take the items, the pictures, the phone numbers, you know, the information about the services they have, stick it in the template, upload it, QA it, make sure it's working, run some ads to it. You would think that that's not that hard, but then every little step along the way, you find out there's actually hundreds of little steps along the way of mm -hmm. things that you might take for granted. Mm -hmm. And when you try to do that at scale, across 80 clients and 30 team members and all kinds of other things that happen along the way, it becomes a disaster. If you don't have really tight process and people who know how to operate in that process and management on top of that. And I've discovered that whether it's a digital marketing agency or a software startup or e-com that the common failures and all of us that are willing to be honest about their worst investment a lot of the common failures are around not knowing how to manage or being so successful that you run out of money because of cash flow, right? Yep. Because on, on paper you're doing well, but cash flow, you know, it's different. Or other things that that, that people will think are, are based on personality or or some kind of personal attack when really it's just not knowing how to manage hire other people, how to hire, train, fire, you know, this this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of largely it's a people issue. It's what I've learned is you need the highest quality people possible. And right. everyone's going to fight for talent. Yep. It's not just digital marketing. So let me summarize a couple of things I take away. I mean, the first thing is that you're talking about risk management, and that's the whole purpose of this podcast is to talk about our mistakes so that we can say, you know, for the listeners out there, don't make these mistakes. Also, you know, the other thing it made me think a lot about is the idea, you know, there's people, you know, there's many people, I think my, I'm one of them that has, have lots of ideas. But ideas are one thing, execution is another. And that's uh, an example that I have of a course that I created. First, I started by writing a PowerPoint of kind of what I wanted to talk about. Then I asked a bunch of my friends to come together and I rented a little room at a hotel and said each even chip, chip in, you know, 50 bucks, whatever, 20 bucks. And then I gave that presentation. And then later um, I iterated through it and then I wrote a book. And then I took the book and then I created it into an online course and it was like, a sustainable process to develop that starting with something so I always sometimes I have some staff with new things and we get on the stage and they say I'm only able to get 10 people in the room for this mm -hmm. particular thing and I say fantastic because I'd rather you know disappoint 10 people yeah. than disappoint 100 so I think that's pretty much the biggest lesson I take out of it um, so based upon what you learned from this story and what you continue to learn what one action would you recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate? Start small, but still dream big. So one of the things I think it's the Navy SEALs say is slow is smooth and smooth mm. is fast. And often we're in such a hurry because of FOMO, because we feel like there's a first mover advantage because we're going to run out of time. I look at the most successful people I know, and they've been at their game. It, before they became famous or whatever you want to call it, it's, it took them all a decade. Yeah. 
And Dream the big. thing is when you start That's with small. just start with just five customers, make sure you take care of them and then let that five turn into 50 and let the 50 turn into 500. Amen. But what we did, we made the mistake, spoke on stage and got 80 clients all at the same time. We were bottleneck. We couldn't handle all of them. Then each of them were calling me. So my phone was bl blowing up. I was trying to answer all of them. But while I was there trying to tell them that we still care, you know, th think about this, right, Andrew, or anyone else listening, where you're trying to spend time doing the work, trying to manage the people, trying to make sure everything's running, but then you have clients. And when the clients aren't happy, then they call you directly. But if they're calling you and you're constantly in meetings with these clients, but you're not, then you're not able to talk to your managers and your managers aren't getting help to be able to help out the team members, the team members then need help, then stuff escalates back to you. So you have more requests than you could possibly handle. And then meanwhile, the managers think that you don't care because you're busy with the clients. The clients think that you don't care mm. because you're busy. So you, and you, they don't realize that they are one of several hundred people that are all asking for your time, right? Yeah. Um, it just makes that statement you said, dream big, start small, just really, really has an impact in this case. So last question, what's your number one goal for the next 12 months? We're gonna launch 10 agencies <laughs> and we've already <laughs> launched three of them and they're going the right way. They're starting- okay, you're, start, you're starting with three. Starting small. And the key is I, instead of putting you know, a, a 20 something CEO, with no experience, I put in place managers who have, who, you know, have a decade plus in managing experience. Mm -hmm. And even if they don't know anything about digital marketing, I found that when you scale up a business, and I look at anybody who's got a business with multiple people, not just them, but yep. dozens of people, all as part of a process, I can always see that there's a COO. There's some kind of business manager running the ship because there's there's a CEO who's about the vision, about sales, about doing deals, about speaking, being a public figure. And then there's a COO, project manager type, who's making the details happen. And it's almost like you, you have a, an artist here and you have an accountant here. And if someone's a good accountant, they're probably not a great artist. In fact, you don't want them. They're probably going to do right. like fraudulent sorts. Of, you don't want them to be creative with the accounting. Right? You want them to be reliable and disciplined and follow the rules and this kind of thing. But someone who's like this, who's very much by the book and all that, is probably not going to inspire people right. and get more customers and innovate. And so I find that for me, I'm better at teaching. I'm better at ideating. I'm better at doing deals because we have great opportunities with other people. And I'm a lousy manager. <laughs> but what, I, what I've done after this failure, which taught me so much, right? Because you, you either get a blessing or you get a lesson, right? I found that I'm just gonna, instead of trying to work on the thing that I suck at, which is managing, I'm gonna find other people who are really good at managing mm -hmm. and just put them in charge. And then I'm gonna do what I do and they do what they do. Great lessons. All right, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. My number one goal for the next 12 months is to help you, my listeners, to reduce risk and increase return in your life. And I'd say, we did a little bit of that today by talking about, you know, risk reduction here. To achieve this, I've created our community at myworstinvestmentever.com, and I look forward to seeing all of you there. As we conclude, Dennis, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. And on behalf of Ace Dots Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the roaring audience? This is going to sound counterintuitive, but I found that by sharing your failures, people respect you more and they're more likely to hire you because the people out there who are selling are all trying to pretend that they're perfect and no one knows. I mean, that we, we know that that's not real. And I found that by exposing the, the mistakes I've made, exposing things that have worked and not worked has been the best surprisingly selling technique because people will then trust you. People then see. So think guys out there and girls, what is it that you do? And what are things that you can talk about that help people understand what it's like running your particular type of business and behind the scenes where, mm -hmm. where people don't understand things that appear monotonous to you can actually be super fascinating. Tomorrow I'm having lunch with Matthew Janusek, who's the CEO of Escape Fitness. And he's one of the top equipment manufacturers of fitness equipment, right? If you go to the gyms, a lot mm -hmm. of the stuff is his stuff. And I found, I was talking with him a couple of years ago and he said, yeah, we have a few factories in China and they're pouring the metal to make the barbells and all this. And 
he said that, ah, but that's boring. You don't want to hear about that. I'm like, no, no, I want to understand. Like, how did you set up the factories and how did you come up with the polyurethane coatings on the barbells and dumbbells? And I, that's fascinating. Like setting up a factory and how do you manage those people and the shipments and the containers and how do you price things? Like, so then he did a little documentary, a little behind the scenes on that. And that's mm. helped him grow his brand. And the same thing for me, right? I've documented behind the scenes on what is it like to do digital marketing, to build websites, to run ads, to hire people, to go to the Philippines, which is not you know far from where you are, Andrew, where we yeah. hire an army of people from the Philippines to do this kind of work. And people found that's fascinating. And I thought, oh, no one wants to hear about our process for hiring people that are three bucks an hour. In yes, the they do. But I'd ask you guys, right? Not just Andrew or me, but what is it that, that you do all the time that you might think is boring and monotonous? Put it out there and, and show things that have worked and not worked. And even if it, you think it's kind of embarrassing, as long as it's not illegal or something like that, you're going to find people will, will really gravitate towards that and, and find it fascinating. You know, I'll just tell you a quick story. I, I, you know, I invite a lot of people to come on the show. And one of my best responses I remember that is memorable. The guy said, great idea not my style. And I huh. thought, yeah, you know, the people that are on this podcast now, almost more than 400 people now are people who are willing to discuss the mistakes that they made. And I definitely believe what you say is that that willingness and that sincerity makes people feel like I can trust this person. So for the listeners out there, go to the website and crawl through all the, if the different people I've interviewed. Those are the people that have the sincerity that will be sincere when things are going wrong, when they're going right. And that's a person you want to work with. So that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.